The material changes have been spectacular. Yeah. We went from solid redwood to a combination of semi-hollow and redwood, then to balsa wood and redwood, then to all balsa wood. But the biggest advent in my mind came during the Second World War where England invented a bomber called the Mosquito Bomber, and they wanted to make it as light as they could, and they made it out of balsa wood, but it had no rigidity. So the engineers came up with a, a solution to making the rigidity factor work by inventing fiberglass and resin. And so right after the war, that became a commercial product and it was available. So then the redwood and the heavier woods went away. The boards became totally balsa wood, fiberglass, and it cut the weight from 80 to 100 pounds to 30 to 40 pounds. Now we had a seven or eight inch deep fin that was fiberglass and wouldn't break off when it hit the beach and it changed everything. So foam really gradually came about. 1958, Hobie started experimenting with foam and all we had then was styrofoam, large cell and very soft. And it was so soft that uh, tools couldn't cut it. It would just kind of mush it. It's where you get the, the coffee cups are made of, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that didn't work. And then we learned that the resin and fiberglass would dissolve the styrofoam. So the cell structure would kind of collapse. So that then, but if you put shellac on it, then you could kind of do it. So there was a lot of experiment to get. So it took three years, really, from 1958 to 61 to get to the foam consistently at the same density and, and then it could be clear and it made it easier and cheaper and everything else. This was the end result. But these are the two first foam boards? Well, there might be some others, but yeah. as far as we know, those are the... the and early. you have them. And we have them. And I'm noticing that all of the boards, they have this little white uh, it looks like a catalog number here. Well, that's exactly what it is. So yeah. we've inventoried every board, taken pictures from every angle, have it all digitized on a computer, along with the history that we know of that board, who made it, shaped it, you know, how we got it, the whole background. You know, that's an important factor to keep all that history together. And the boards that we have upstairs, we've inventoried those as well. But those are boards that we lend out to other museums, but the ones here on the floor, we don't lend those out. Take a look up there? Absolutely. Go up there right now. Yeah, and these are all inventory too. This is yeah. S662. Uh -huh. And that corresponds to yeah, some computer entry. Right. They're yeah. all on the computer. I love it. This surfboard archive. And all the decades are re clearly represented here. I mean, you can tell that this comes from a certain period. Yeah. And, well. No, it's all, you know, that's why I say we, we have enough boards. We could have three museums, uh, you know, as, if we were going to take all these down and display them. Yeah. And there's some really great boards here that have a lot of history to them, but we just can't show all of them. Technological innovation literally transformed surfing. Today, surfing looks quite different than it did in the endless summer. But the youthful energy we saw in Mike Hinson and Robert August continues to define the sport.